Tonight, criminal indictment. U.S. charges tycoon Gautam Adani with defrauding investors hiding plan to bribe Indian officials. Israel-Gaza war. U.S. vetoes Security Council's Gaza ceasefire resolution for the fourth time it has used its veto power during the conflict. Lava fury. A volcanic fissure near Grindavik, Iceland erupted for the tenth time in three years prompting evacuation. And the power of sound. A UK startup is using acoustic radiation pressure from high-intensity sound waves to make objects fly up in the air. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We are here to bring you key stories across the globe and we begin today in neighbouring India. Indian billionaire Gautam Adani has been charged with fraud in the US which has accused him of orchestrating a 250 million bribery scheme and concealing it to raise money in the US. The criminal charges filed in New York are the latest blow to the 62-year-old Adani, one of the world's richest men whose business empire extends from ports and airports to renewable energy. U.S. authorities have indicted Indian billionaire Gautam Adani over an alleged multi-billion dollar bribery and fraud scheme. The indictment was filed Wednesday in New York. It accuses Adani and his nephew Sagar of paying $265 million in bribes to Indian government officials to obtain solar energy supply contracts. Prosecutors also allege the Adanis and another executive at Adani Green Energy, former CEO Vineet Jain, concealed corruption from lenders and investors to secure $3 billion in loans and bonds. Five other people were hit with related charges. Arrest warrants have been issued for Gautam and Sagar Adani. There was no comment from the Adani Group or India's embassy in Washington. According to Forbes magazine, Adani is worth $69.8 billion. That makes him the world's 22nd richest person and India's second richest. Last week, Adani said in a social media post that he planned to invest $10 billion in U.S. energy security and infrastructure projects and create a potential 15,000 jobs. Also, the former billionaire investor Bill Huang has been sentenced to 18 years in prison over the collapse of Archegos Capital Management, which cost Wall Street banks more than $10 billion. The one-time billionaire investor was sentenced Wednesday by a New York court. He had been convicted there in July on 10 charges, including wire fraud, securities fraud and market manipulation. It all dates back to March 2021, when Huang's Archegos investment fund imploded in less than a week. Prosecutors accused him of lying to banks in order to borrow vast sums of money to make highly leveraged bets on media and technology stocks. Securities and Exchange Commission Director of Enforcement Gerber Grewal set out the charges in April 2022. Huang's downfall came when stock prices started to move against him, ultimately wiping out over $100 billion of market value. Banks, including Credit Suisse and Nomura, were left holding huge losses on their loans. Prosecutors had sought a 21-year jail term, unusually long for a white-collar crime. They also want him to forfeit over $12 billion and make restitution to victims. The judge is yet to rule on whether that will be required. Huang's lawyers say his net worth is now only around $55 million. They had argued he should face no prison time, saying there was no danger of him committing further crimes. The labor union of Seoul Metro, which operates subway lines 1 to 8, launched a work-to-rule slowdown protest. This entails intentionally driving metro trains slower than usual, leading to inconvenience for passengers. Seoul Metro's labor union held a press conference on Tuesday and announced its demands, such as a wage hike and the withdrawal of a single attendance system amid restructuring efforts. The union plans to go on a full-scale strike in early December if the demands are not met. The Korean Railway Workers Union began a similar protest earlier this week, causing delays to several metro lines. 
Violence has escalated in the Haitian capital, Port-au-Prince, with the United Nations Human Rights Office of the High Commissioner saying that at least 150 people were killed and some hundred injured in the past week alone. Now, difficult conditions continue in Haiti, with some 80% of the Haitian capital still controlled by well-armed gangs, where civilians are routinely being targeted. Around 20,000 people have also been forced to flee their homes since a coalition of gangs began pushing for total control of the country's capital on November 11th. UN Human Rights Chief Volker Turk expressed grave concern, saying that some 4 million residents of Port-au-Prince are practically being held hostage by an alliance of Haitian gangs controlling all the main roads in and out of the capital. Now, while a Kenya-led international force has been deployed in Haiti to support the Haitian military and police, the UN Human Rights Office estimates some 700,000 people are now displaced across the country. It also said that up to Wednesday, 4,544 deaths have been caused by gang violence, with another 2,060 people injured. Well, now let's take a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. On the road to the White House tonight, U.S. President-elect Donald Trump has tapped former Acting Attorney General Matt Whitaker as the next U.S. Ambassador to the NATO. A calling him a strong warrior and loyal patriot, a Trump said Whitaker would ensure U.S. interests are advanced and defended, adding that Washington's relationship with NATO will be strengthened. The nomination comes despite Whitaker's background in law enforcement and not foreign policy. He had been considered for attorney general, but the position was instead given to Matt Gates earlier this month. A powerful storm known as Bomb Cyclone slammed the northwest United States and parts of Canada, leaving some 650,000 without power and at least two people dead. Schools in western parts of Washington state have temporarily cancelled classes as falling trees killed at least two people in the state overnight. A bomb cyclone occurs when a storm rapidly intensifies over a short period of time due to a rapid fall in central air pressure. Now, gusts of up to 124 kilometers per hour were recorded in Washington state, while the coast of British Columbia saw winds of up to 163 kilometers per hour. Now, in Washington state, over 650,000 homes or businesses lost power by Wednesday morning, while 140,000 were cut off in British Columbia, and more than 24,000 were left without power in California. The cyclone is predicted to move towards Northern California, with strong winds and heavy rains expected to continue through Friday in the affected regions. The UN Security Council has rejected yet another draft resolution calling for a ceasefire in Gaza. It was put forward by 10 non-permanent members and called for an immediate and permanent truce. It also demanded the release of all Israeli captives held by Hamas. A UN Security Council draft resolution was put forward by 10 non-permanent members on Wednesday calling for a ceasefire in Gaza. For a resolution to be adopted, it must receive at least nine votes in favor, with no vetoes by any of the UNSC permanent members. However, despite receiving 14 votes in favor of the draft resolution, it failed to pass due to one veto from a permanent member, the United States. According to the U.S. envoy to the U.N., the veto comes as it was believed the draft resolution would not have secured the release of hostages. The veto was still met with major backlash despite the explanation from the U.S. ambassador to the U.N. The draft resolution does demand the immediate and unconditional release of all hostages. However, the U.S. felt the language was not strong enough, adding that the ceasefire was not on the condition of the release of hostages. Wood also added that the draft failed to condemn Hamas for the October 7th terrorist attack. Meanwhile, after visiting Beirut, U.S. Envoy Amos Hochstein is headed to Israel to continue negotiations on an Israel-Hezbollah ceasefire. He is expected to meet with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu on Thursday 
as the Lebanese government and Hezbollah accepted a U.S.-led draft proposal. However, details of the ceasefire proposal are still unclear, and it remains to be seen whether Israel would also agree to the agreement after Hashtain's visit. Palestinian authorities have rejected, meanwhile, Israel's proposal to create a buffer zone in northern Gaza, which would involve evacuating civilians to make room for military operations. The plan, which Israel argues is necessary for its security and would forcibly displace thousands of Palestinians, according to the Palestinian leadership. Nabil Abu Rudeine, official spokesman for the Palestinian presidency, said in a statement carried by WAFA that the talk about the so-called establishment of a buffer zone in the northern Gaza Strip and Jabalia with long-term Israeli military presence was completely unacceptable and is therefore rejected. Abu Rudeine considered the plan to be in violation of all international legitimacy resolutions and international law that consider the Gaza Strip an integral part of the occupied Palestinian territory. On the 5th of October, the Israeli army began intense bombardment of areas in the northern Gaza Strip before launching a large-scale military operation there, especially in Jabalia. The Israeli army says its operation in Jabalia and its surroundings aims to prevent Hamas fighters from regrouping to launch more attacks and create conditions for its plan of building buffers on to distribute aid through a private American company and with foreign funding. However, the Palestinian spokesman said that any plans related to the future of Gaza Strip or the distribution of aid can only be done through the State of Palestine and the United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestine Refugees in the Near East as well as other relevant international organizations. The Palestinian death toll from ongoing Israeli attacks in the Gaza Strip since October last year has risen to 43,985, according to a Gaza-based health authority statement. All this year's G20 summit concluded under a cloud of much uncertainty in light of Donald Trump's planned return to the White House with tougher tariffs and Russia's ongoing invasion of Ukraine, complicated further with the inclusion of North Korean troops. Under the theme Building a Just World and a Sustainable Planet, the 19th G20 Summit in Rio de Janeiro wrapped up on Tuesday local time with leaders pledging collective action on climate change, poverty and inequality. Global trade took center stage with members reaffirming their commitment to a fair, open, multilateral system amid rising protectionist sentiments expected under the Donald Trump administration's second term. China's President Xi Jinping, a standout figure at the summit, advocated for stronger economic ties with developing nations, including those in the global south, and promoted unilateral trade policies, likely seeking allies amid the shifting global dynamics caused by Trump's election. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov, representing President Vladimir Putin, warned that Ukraine's use of long-range attack missiles against its territory marked a new phase of the Western war and vowed that Russia would respond accordingly. President Yoon Sung-yeol called for an immediate halt to military cooperation between Russia and North Korea. He emphasized the need for the international community to recognize its illicit nature and work together to end it. Brazil's President Lula pushed for a global wealth tax and successfully launched the Global Alliance Against Hunger and Poverty, but struggled to unite nations on climate funding and fossil fuel limits. Meanwhile, U.S. President Joe Biden, in his final G20 appearance before retiring, missed a key photo opportunity due to a late arrival, but ended the summit with smiles during the final session. The next G20 summit is scheduled to take place in South Africa next year. Meanwhile, Ukraine fired long-range British Storm Shadow missiles at targets within Russia for the first time, while the U.S. has decided to give Ukraine anti-personal landmines on top of allowing the use of its Atakums missiles in Russia. Ukraine has used UK-supplied long-range missiles for the first time in its war against Russia. An official speaking on condition of anonymity confirmed that British Storm Shadow cruise missiles with a range of 250 kilometers were launched on Wednesday against targets in Russia. Fragments of the missiles were reportedly found in the Kursk region, where North Korean troops are deployed. The attack comes a day after Ukraine fired U.S. Atakums missiles for the first time into Russian territory, after their use was approved by U.S. President Joe Biden this week. The British government declined to comment about the use of its long-range missiles, but according to the BBC, the U.K.'s defense secretary had been in contact with officials in Ukraine on Tuesday night. The U.K.'s Prime Minister Keir Starmer had hinted at support for Ukraine during the recent G20 summit in Brazil. Also on Wednesday, the U.S. said it would support Ukraine with anti-personnel landmines in a reversal of its current policy. 
The decision was followed by backlash from humanitarian organizations over concerns about the threat such weapons pose to civilians. However, the U.S. State Department said the landmines are comparatively safe as they become inert after a period of time. Also on Wednesday, countries including the U.S. temporarily shut their embassies in Kyiv amid the threat of Russian attacks inside Ukraine. But the U.S. officials said their embassy will return to normal operations on Thursday. A volcano near Iceland's capital, Reykjavik, erupted for the tenth time in three years, spewing fountains of lava and smoke, according to the country's meteorological office. The Live from Iceland website showed video of volcanic activity from two locations, one from the top of a neighboring mountain to the west of the volcano and one from Vogastapi, which is just west of the town of Vogar on the northern side of the Reykjans Peninsula. As magma accumulated underground, authorities had warned of imminent volcanic activity on the peninsula, some 30 kilometers southwest of the capital Reykjavik, where most recent eruptions ended only on the 6th of September. The outbreaks of the Reykjans Peninsula, known as fissure eruptions, have not directly affected the capital city and do not cause significant dispersal of ash into the stratosphere, avoiding air traffic disruption. <laughs> A short commercial break now, more world news on the other side. Welcome back and finally tonight, UK startup Acoustofab uses sound waves for acoustic levitation to make objects levitate. The tech could handle toxic materials and automate life tasks without contamination or waste. A UK startup is using sound waves to make objects levitate in mid-air. And London-based Acoustofab says its, quote, acoustic levitation is not just a neat trick. It could also have commercial applications, such as for handling toxic materials. Co-founder Sriram Subramanian said the technology uses an array of tiny speakers to aim ultrasonic sound waves at a particular point. This creates what developers describe as a pressure cage, strong enough to support a droplet or particle. Shubi Bansal is another co-founder. She said that the ability to manipulate liquids without contaminating them offers exciting opportunities in life sciences, where toxic materials are handled daily all around the world. And with that, we wrap up today's bulletin. Join us again tomorrow for the latest updates from around the world. Thank you for watching and have a good night.